morning and welcome to the Cosmic Shambles Stay at Home Festival and our Saturday Family Science Club. We've got loads of stuff for you today. Before I get into that, there's a couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, first of all, we're doing lots of these shows. The Stay at Home Festival is happening in lots of ways. Uh, so you can look at the Cosmic Shambles website uh, slash stay at home and that will tell you everything that's happening. And in particular, there's a show tomorrow at 3 p.m. So if you've got any science questions, perhaps arising from things we did today, then ask them before that show tomorrow um so uh oh and the other thing is that, that one of the reasons we're doing these shows is that there are lots of performers and art venues that are obviously not getting any work at the moment so we do have a tip bucket so if you're the adult of the family watching uh and you wouldn't mind bunging a couple of quid in the tip bucket if you are able then we'd very much appreciate that so again that's on the cosmic shambles website so let's get started with stuff this morning we have four fabulous guests for you uh we've got dallas campbell the scarlet oak theater susie kundu and johnny berlinus and we've got just loads and loads and bits and pieces of science to, to get stuck into this morning, some of which you can join in with or have a go for yourself at home. So I'm going to get started because, um, and it's Easter, so I thought I've got, this is this is what a physicist uses for a table, I've got textbooks. So I've got an egg demo that you can try at home, and um, I have two eggs here. Now, one of these eggs, they've got little labels on them. One's got a triangle on it and one's got a circle on it. That's just so you can tell them apart. Now, the important thing about these two eggs is that one of them has been hard boiled and the other one is raw. Um, and they, they just look like eggs, right? I couldn't tell from here. I, I, I've, I've labeled them afterwards, so I don't know which one is which. But I'm going to show you how to tell a raw egg from a boiled egg without taking the shell off. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put them on a flat surface and just... I'm a bit worried they're going to fall off the flat surface. You're going to get them spinning. There we go. Um, I'm going to get them spinning a bit faster. Oops. I'm going to... I, I tell you, I can't do it both at once. I'm going to do it one at a time. So here's one spinning, and then I'm going to put my finger on it to stop, and it stops the egg, as you would expect. Now, I'm going to set the other one spinning. Bit, this one seems to want to run away. <laughs> so here's the other egg. I'm going to put my finger on it to stop, and it keeps spinning. Let's watch that one again. So here's my egg. Get it going. Just put the finger on top to stop the shell and it keeps spinning and then it's going to roll away. Now, um, have a little think for a minute because there's enough information in that to tell which one of these is boiled and which one of them is raw. Um, so if you've got a guess, so the triangle was the one that stopped and the circle was the one that kept spinning after I stopped it. So have a bit of a think about that and I'm going to show you. So here's my prediction. This one the one with the triangle, the one that stopped, this one is the hard boiled egg. And the one that wouldn't stop, that kept spinning even after I'd stopped the shell, that's the raw egg. Um, and the reason for that, and I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna prove that to you. So here's the one that spins and it stops completely. And I am so confident that this one is hard boiled that I'm gonna crack it on the thing The difference is that when you there is a physics rule called conservation of angular momentum that says that when you start something spinning, it will stay spinning unless you do something to stop it. So in the case of a solid egg, when you just put your finger on it, you stop the whole egg. And because it's solid, it stopped. That's just the end of it. But when the egg is liquid in the middle and you put your finger on it, you only stop the shell. And the laws of physics say that since you didn't stop, stop all the liquid uh, white and yolk in the middle, they just keep going. So when you take your finger away, they push on the shell and start the egg spinning again. So that's my tip for you this morning. That is how you tell the difference between a raw egg and a boiled egg, should that be useful over Easter, if you're the sort of person that puts your boiled eggs back in the fridge. Right, we're going to move on now from eggs and we're going to go to uh, Dallas Campbell, who has done loads of amazing stuff on TV and uh, is interested in all sorts of things, but has an special interest in space. And in fact, he wrote an amazing book, Ad Astra, an illustrated guide to leaving the planet, which has all kinds of ridiculous space things in it. Um, Dallas, how, how are, are you this morning? morning? I'm okay. I'm wearing, this is my, this is my new, let me take this off. Can you, <laughs> it looks a bit hot. This is my new, this is, when I want to go out to the shops, this is what I wear now, an Apollo era space helmet. 
very so, handy. So this is a real. Tell me what this is because because you got you you've got your little cap on there as well. Where where does all this stuff? What is all of this? Where does it come from? Here's the thing. When I was little, when I was a kid, there used to be this cartoon show on television on Saturday mornings called Mr. Ben. And in Mr. Ben, you might remember. Actually, you'll be too young, Helen. But anyway, Mr. Ben. Um, he used to go down to the, to the end of his street and there was a magic costume shop at the end of his street and every week he'd put on a different costume and have that adventure. So sometimes he, you know, he'd put on a cowboy outfit and sometimes he put on a, a space outfit. Uh, so anyway, so this is my own space outfit. This actually um, is uh, what's called a Snoopy helmet and what you're seeing here behind me, this is, it's actually a replica of Neil Armstrong's Apollo A7L spacesuit, so the exact spacesuit that Neil Armstrong uh, wore on the moon. Now, it's not the the real one's actually in the Smithsonian behind very very thick glass because it's an incredibly valuable and important object. This was made by a guy called Ryan Nagata, uh, who makes spacesuits for movies. So he did spacesuits for the Neil Armstrong biopic First Man and, and and such. And he's an amazing amazing artist. I actually love his work. So I've actually sort of inherited. In fact, this is the very first one that Ryan made, and I love it because when I was a kid, I always wanted to have a spacesuit in my house, and look, now I have one. So there you go. This is part of it, yes. So you can dress up as a spaceman exactly. in your own living room. Yeah, dressing up's good. If you can't go somewhere, just just wear the right outfit, and your imagination will will take you there. So, what sort of details can you see on suit? Because we associate uh, most of us haven't ever really seen a spacesuit. What do you need to have on one? Well, it's, it's a really really good question. Space. Amazing objects because they are essentially a wearable spacecraft. It's a spacecraft of the smallest possible dimensions. So everything a spacecraft needs to give you to survive, all the life support things, has to be within, engineered within this outfit. So, for example, just, just I'll show you what I've got on. This is called the Snoopy cap, and this is just a communications cap. So in here, um, I've got a pair of just a pair of headphones and two microphones, so I can actually speak. Uh, to the ground as you actually quite handy for Skype calls I could just sort of plug this into my computer and talk. <laughs> this is very very important so this is a helmet but it's a very strange looking helmet it's called a bubble helmet and this is designed to actually hold pressure in the suit because as well as having air to breathe and everything else that you would expect you also need to bring your air pressure with you because obviously outside the atmosphere there you know there is no air and air doesn't weigh anything and we have evolved to live at sort of one atmosphere and of course so a spacesuit really is, it's almost like wearing uh, an inflatable bicycle in the tube. So the actual suit <laughs> pumped up. It doesn't so, sound comfortable, that. It doesn't sound like a comfortable thing to have to do. No, it's not. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pick this up and I'll take, I'll, I'll take you over and you can have a little look at it. Um, so this whole, this whole kind of suit, if, if you can see, these ports on the front are designed so kind of air circulates, it gets plugged in and you wear um, a, a sort of backpack on the back. But this whole thing is designed to hold pressure. So this whole suit inflates. And so it's basically exactly like wearing um, a sort of human shaped bicycle inner tube. In fact, I might be able to, if I just show you, if I just take one of the gloves off, can you still see me? Uh, yes. If I take one of the gloves off, so these gloves actually hold pressure, so they're kind of floppy now. But if I if I sort of blow into it, <laughs> it's like a balloon. And so basically it is just like a balloon. That's the main sort of function. But then, of course, it has to kind of regulate temperature and it has to be, uh, depending on where you're going, of course, the moon is very, very abrasive. So that white outer layer has to be very, very tough to stop the abrasive lunar surface actually damaging the suit and, uh, you know, compromising it. See, what you're talking about there is dust. You know, we see that when those old videos of, of men standing on the moon, that, you know, that there would be this sort of grey, grey dust. And, and that's what you're saying is that that's actually quite sharp. It's not like kind of we think of sand at the seaside as being quite smooth. You know, it's comfortable. You know, you, it doesn't it doesn't cut you really unless you're very unlucky but what you're saying is that moon dust is, is not like that and it could damage the spacesuit absolutely well if you think about things like sand on earth or, or bits of grit or anything on earth it's it's been subject to the the processes of the earth so weathering and erosion and all those kinds of things but because of course there's no atmosphere and no gravity on the moon those little tiny particles remain very sharp and very very abrasive and also they they sort of, they can stick to the suit this sort of electrical charge that sort of builds up actually sticks to the suit 
And of course, when they were designing those suits in the 1960s, they didn't really know that. You know, they were building, engineering this, this, this outfit based on a planet that we had no real experience of. So a lot of it was sort of guesswork and not quite known. But I've actually got here, you'll like this, Helen, I've actually got a little bit of moon dust. This real is, moon dust, proper this, real moon dust. This is a pot of moon dust. It's actually, well, I say real moon dust. It's, it's moon dust that's not actually from the moon. Um, <laughs> it's actually from the... It's actually from NASA, but this is what's what they call simulant moon dust. So it's actually made by scientists here on Earth, but it's made to exactly mimic the mechanical and chemical uh, properties of moon dust. So scientists can actually study it. They can use it. They can, for example, if they're testing the new generation of spacesuits that are going to the moon, they can actually use it. I'll, I'll pour a bit out on a, on a bit of paper, and then you can, and then you can see. But it looks. Hang on. I'm going to does, just it feel, does it feel sharp? Does it feel different to normal sand? Yeah. Well, uh, can you? I'm going to have to try and uh, mix it up a little bit. Little there. Bit. there you go. Yeah. So it's like a grey talcum powder. If I just put my finger on it, it doesn't really feel that sort of abrasive at all. But you, you can. I mean, it's rough. It's not like smooth like a talcum powder, but it has that same kind of consistency. Um, but yes, it was incredibly damaging to those suits. In fact, I. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the chance to um, film some of the real Apollo suits, and we looked at the materials through a microscope, and you can still see, 50 years later, all that lunar dust, that lunar regolith, all buried within the fibres of the suit. And it's a, real, it's a really important thing for, for scientists to study how, when we go back to the moon, for example, or anywhere else, Mars, for example, how are we going to design materials, clothes that are going to withstand the rigors of being on another planet. Because of course, you've got to remember that that suit, Neil Armstrong's suit, only did a couple of hours service. It was only on the moon for a couple of hours. And, and even after that time, it was pretty much destroyed. It was very, very badly damaged. So we're going to be on the moon longer than a few hours next time we go. So we have to, we have to really think about that. It's a good job for scientists and engineers, spacesuit design, very important. <laughs> So let's move forward in time to like, like more modern uh, space travel because that was that was all right from the beginning when when people were just getting going on this as an idea. Yeah. Um, now you have something else that uh, you've got another show and tell. I, show us I, the, I, the other one. Well, I kind of thought these are the things that you know when we think about space travel, we tend to think about rockets and that kind of stuff. But it's actually things like clothing design is really really important. And because you were doing an egg demo. I thought as a companion little show and tell in my museum of things I probably shouldn't have. Um, this was, um, this was a, a, a bacon sandwich, one of Tim Peake's. Tim Peake, Tim Peake's bacon sandwich. One of the things, of course, when you're on the International Space Station or you're on any space station or spending a long time in space, is the importance of food, not just to keep you alive, but also to keep your morale going. So here we all are experience in this lockdown and not allowed to go outside really food takes on a really really important component in terms of your psychology keeping you happy and so all the astronauts who spend uh, you know six months or a year on the ISS they get to sort of choose what food they take and of course Tim's favorite food what he wanted was a bacon sandwich what so is he, it a tin what's all well, that about well I'm going to show you so you might be able to see on the label hang on let me just get my finger on the the name of the chef who made it. Can you read that? Oh, it's Heston Blumenthal. Heston, yeah, Heston Blumenthal. Because who else are you going to get to design a bacon sandwich that'll be fit for space and Heston Blumenthal? So the thing is about sandwiches in space is because you're in microgravity on the International Space Station, because you're in orbit falling around the Earth, things like crumbs from a regular slice of bread are a really, really bad idea. So Heston had to come up with a design a new recipe for a type of bread and a bacon sandwich that wouldn't sort of crumb in space, and 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 um, and this was the result. And did you like them? Does it? Does it? Did he say? Does it taste like a bacon sandwich? Yeah, no. Apparently, I spoke to him, and he did. He's, they're very, very good. So I've managed. I'm I, the temptation to open this. <laughs> you like, can't do it. But I you can't, can't do it. I was looking at the. Uh, I was looking at the 2017 actually. 2017. Well. I think definitely, definitely it, yes. Why, Leave it in its tin. We'll never know. It's like the, the Schrodinger's sandwich. We'll never know uh, whether it's in there or not. <laughs> a bit like Greg, like when you spin it round, if you shake it, I can feel the, the angular momentum. I can feel it in there. Oh, really? It's definitely moving. <laughs> okay. I'd, take, I'd take the risk and eat the out-of-date bacon sandwich just so, just so um, 
just so I can say I've eaten one. But so there's, there's, there's loads to talk about. We haven't got time. We have had a question, a, li a question live. You can send us your questions if you're watching. Yeah. Send them in. We'll answer them if we can. Uh, yeah. And it's on on Earth. How much does the whole suit weigh? Because of course it would weigh the real suit, Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. How much does it weigh on Earth and on the Moon? Was the weight, weight a consideration? Yeah, well, really, really, I, I don't actually have a, a figure for the entire weight but because obviously you've got the suit itself, which is pretty heavy. You know, the suit itself, the, the, the white um, uh, overgarment is made of a beta cloth, which doesn't really weigh much, but it's a, it's a glass fiber type of material. But inside, underneath that, you've got the pressure garment, which is rubber, it's neoprene, actually 21 layers of different materials. Plus, you've got lots of cabling to stop the suit inflating too much. That all adds weight. And so, and of course, you've got the big backpack, which contains oxygen cylinders and, and, and all kinds of other equipment. So really, really heavy. Imagine picking up a really, really heavy backpack. But as you say, on the surface of the moon, that weight doesn't really have the same kind of consideration because, of course, you've got one-sixth gravity on the moon. And currently, the space, you know, the astronauts, the suits that are on the International Space Station, they actually train in what's called the neutral buoyancy tank, which is a huge swimming pool. So again, you know, anyone who's scuba dive knows that the weight of your oxygen tank is, is counteracted by the, the, the your kind of... Um, uh, what's it called? What's it, you know, your inflatable. Like BCD. Yeah. Yeah. I should. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So, so weight isn't the massive problem. We have, we, we could clearly talk about that for a long time. I know <laughs> you have to go. I think if you do have questions, other questions for Dallas, I'm sure he'll answer them on Twitter or we can pass them along to him. Uh, so do ask those. So Dallas, thank you very much. Lovely to see you, Helen. Nice to see you. Enjoy the rest of the show. Enjoy the demos coming up and I'll talk to you soon. Bye Dallas. Everyone. Bye. Okay, so but we are still here, and next up we have the fabulous Scarlet Oak yeah. Theatre, who are yeah. people who make the theatre uh, make theatre about the natural world for kids, and they have got some fabulous friends who help them with that task. So here is the Scarlet Oak Theatre. Hello, I'm Jas, and I'm Chia, and we are the zoo that comes to you. We wanted to make a place where animals could come if they needed a home. So now our house is a sanctuary for all kinds of animals. We've got parrots, a zebra, uh, antelope, a blue right there's there. even northern rockhopper penguins. Yes. Our animals only stay with us for as long as it takes for a place on a bigger sanctuary to become available for them. Most of the animals that we provide a home for are endangered species. Endangered is when the number of animals in that species is going down and down until they're at risk of becoming extinct. When they're extinct, it means there's no more of that animal left. Jazz is going to go and get somebody now who is on the critically endangered list of animals. And that's mostly because their habitat, the place where they live, is being destroyed. Now, she's come all the way from the Sumatran rainforest to live with us. Normally in the wild, she would be living with her mum at this point because she's still a baby and then only when she was an adult would she become solitary and live on her own. So while she's been here with us, we've had lots of one-to-one -one care time which is great because she is super silly, she gives the best hugs in the world and she's just really lovely and she loves to chat, okay? So this is Angela everybody! Yeah! Hey! Hello. 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 It's right. Are you happy? Um, you good? You okay? Yes, yes, yes. Are you okay? Yes. Do you want to wave hello to everybody? Who? All the people at home. Really? Everyone's at home, Gia. Yeah. yeah, but look, we're filming it. We're filming it so we can send it to loads of people. What, on a camera? Yeah. Oh. Can I do it? Uh, Please, no. I'll be the director. Angela, could you? And then, and Angela, then, Angela, no, 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 no. Angela, 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 stop. Pause, yeah. pause, 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 pause. Yeah. pause. It actually took us quite a long time to get that in the right place. Oh. So if you could just leave it there, that'd be really helpful. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, cheer up, boys. Oh, I know, I know. That is why I put up the A-frame, so you can show everybody your swinging skills. <gasps> yes! Ah, oh, okay. Yes. This time, afraid. I made it. Oh, did you? Uh, no. But I designed it. Did you? Mm, no. But... It was my idea. It was your idea. That yes. is absolutely right. Now, are you ready? Yes. Take it away, Angela. Uh, I am Angela. And I am an orangutan. Orangutans are great at swimming because we've got long arms. We've got strong arms. And we've got opposable 
done. Cool. What does opposable mean? Oak Theatre. I love those animals. They're fabulous, aren't they? If you'd like to find out more about Scarlet Oak and their animals, uh, you can go to their website, which is 
scarletoaktheatre.com. You can look at their Twitter feed, which is at Scarlet Oak UK, or the links will be in the description for this show. So do go and find out how to, um, yeah, find out about the other animals they've got and even more about what they do. Just, I love those puppets so much. All right, we're moving on now to chocolate time, which is obviously uh, a very important part of this weekend. And we are going to talk to Susie Kundi, who is a material scientist and works in tech as well, does all kinds of things. Uh, now, she is going to tell us lots of things about chocolates, aren't you, Susie? I am, do. Thank you I so am. much, Helen. As we all know, it is Easter weekend. And as Jacinta Ardern has confirmed, the Easter bunny is an essential worker. Now, obviously, with a lot of the transportation systems being under quite a lot of pressure, we don't know whether the Easter Bunny can get everywhere, but if you are lucky enough, you might just get a little chocolate delivery tomorrow. Um, now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the science of chocolate, but let's start with the history of chocolate, first of all. So, chocolate has been around for an incredibly long time, but probably not in the way that we're used to seeing it and tasting it. Um, from as long ago as 1500 BC, the Mayans and the Aztecs, they were drinking a very bitter drink based on chocolate. It was called Chocolatl, which is where we get the name from. But it wasn't actually until the 1800s that we started to kind of look at chocolate quite differently, see how we can add some sugar to it, add some milk to it, and actually start to compress it down into the solid bars that we know today. Now, they are heavily engineered but first off how do we make chocolate well i was lucky enough um on my honeymoon to visit beautiful belize um, and in particular a chocolate farm called ish cacao so this i'm going to show you this little picture here this is this was our tour guide at ish cacao and it's a cocoa farm and on this cocoa farm they grow these incredible trees and this is a cocoa tree here so you can hopefully see these little cocoa pods and I will tweet these pictures later just in case you can't see them so well now if you break one of these open you can hopefully see that but I will tweet that properly later it's a little bit like um kind of a giant pea pod where you break it open and there are lots of these small kind of seeds inside and these are actually what we call the cocoa beans and they're surrounded by this white almost fatty material which is the cocoa butter so in order to make chocolate, what you need to do is take off all of that cocoa butter. So you're just left with this seed like this. And then you roast these and you roast them because you want to bring out the best flavour in these seeds. So they go through a reaction which is known as the Maillard reaction, which I consider the most delicious of the reactions. It's the thing that gives all delicious things, they're incredible flavour, whether it's coffee, whether it's steak if you're a meat eater, and definitely in chocolate. So what you end up with are these, these roasted cocoa, um, these little tiny cocoa beans. Now you kind of sift through them and get all the little husky bits off and you break it down until you're left with something like this. So you have a whole bunch of cocoa nibs. So you can buy these in the supermarket. A lot of people like to top their porridge with them, for example. And then what you can do is you grind it until you get this paste. And that's your basic chocolate. That's kind of how chocolate has been traditionally made. And this is what they do in Ish Cacao in this cocoa farm to make all of their delicious chocolate as well. And um, you can add some sugar to it because, of course, the, the, the chocolate as it is is very bitter. And what you get is chocolate that we know and love today. So it's really interesting that the actual Latin name for the chocolate tree is Theobroma cacao. And Theobroma actually means food of the gods. It comes from the Greek, the food of the gods. And I think it pretty much is. And the fact that it grows on a tree, I mean, it kind of that chocolate might count as one of your fun. But what I wanted to talk about a little bit more is some of the actual science that goes into chocolate making, because chocolate is probably one of the most heavily engineered products that we know and it's big business. and so for each sort of kilogram bar we use between 300 and 600 of these tiny cocoa now given that each one of those pods contains about 30 to 40 of those little beans it takes an awful lot to make just one big slab of chocolate so chocolate that we know kind of comes in three main flavors i would say so we have this beautiful dark chocolate here we have some milk chocolate which has a little bit less of the cocoa content um, by uh, 
by percentage, has a little bit more of the milk. And then, of course, we have white chocolate. Now, we call it chocolate, but we'll come to that in a moment. So the way that this is engineered is so that each bit of chocolate has a beautiful gloss. It has a great snap to it. We're going to do a bit of an experiment now. If you have some chocolates to hand, please go and grab it. We are going to start with grabbing three different types of chocolate. Now, I struggled a little bit because I had to just sort of make do with what we had in the cupboards. Um, so I have some dark chocolate here. I have some milk chocolate. And I have what is a, a white chocolate button with a smarty in it. It's fine. We'll work with it. Now, the best part of this kind of experiment is that you absolutely can eat what you're doing. Do try at home. So the first thing that you want to do when you're trying to compare different types of chocolate is listen for the snap. Now this is something that everybody finds find pretty appealing. So if I just bring this to the mic, you should have heard the really enticing snap of the chocolate. Now that was the dark chocolate there. The milk chocolate still has a bit of a snap. I'm not going to try it with the white one because it is a little bit too teeny tiny. So then let's compare the look of it before we start to get to the tasting. So even though it is currently 21 degrees, it's pretty warm for Mark, you can hopefully see a fair bit of a gloss on this chocolate right here. Now, that again makes it quite appealing if you want to eat it, which is exactly what we're going to do next. Now, back in what must have been the 90s, I kind of just about remember, M&M's had a slogan about their chocolate, which said that it melts in the mouth, not in the hand. And that's exactly what all chocolate should do, really, because, again, it's engineered so that it doesn't melt in your hand, even at 21 degrees today. It's not melting in my hand, but if I put it in my mouth, you should get, you shouldn't speak with your mouth full, but I am for science, you should get a delicious burst of flavours, and as the chocolate starts to melt, you start to taste lots of different elements. Now, this is exactly what you want chocolate to do. The final thing you kind of want to, to think about is how these flavours are actually appearing. So does the chocolate melt quickly or does it melt quite slowly? Now, depending on whether it melts, melts quickly or slowly, you can get different kinds of flavours at different times. So first of all, those very delicate flavours will come off and then you start to get some of those deeper, bolder flavours coming through the chocolate. What on earth has this got to do with engineering, to do with science? Well, it all comes down to the cocoa butter inside the chocolate. So you can absolutely try this at home. Cocoa butter is that white patty stuff that I showed you was inside the pod. Now this cocoa butter can come in a few different forms. There are six different forms that it can take. And each of these different forms have a different way that these little bits clump together. So although you can't see it, inside this chocolate, there are lots and lots of these tiny crystals of cocoa butter. And depending on the type of crystal, you get different kinds of chocolate. So there are six types. Types one to four have a very low melting temperature. So in this kind of environment, they melt very, very quickly. The type that people are always after is the fifth type of cocoa butter because it has the perfect density to kind of create a crumbly chocolate, but it also melts at between about 27 degrees Celsius and um, about 33 degrees Celsius. So when you see people making chocolate on the Great British Bake Off, for example, they have to be very careful with what they call tempering. And tempering is the process by which they try and encourage their chocolate and the cocoa butter in that chocolate to take on this fifth form of chocolate. Because that gives the most pleasurable experience when you are eating your chocolate. It doesn't melt in your mouth, uh, in your hands, but it does melt in your mouth, releasing all of those flavours. It creates the glossiness that we see on the chocolate. It maintains that beautiful snap that you get when you break it off. So really, there's quite a lot of chemistry going on in chocolate. But this isn't just, you know, in basic chocolate. When you start to think about the amount of engineering that goes on in creating a Cadbury's cream egg, for example, how do they get the filling inside to stay gooey? Again, it's an experiment that you can look at, and it's a bit of research you can totally do at home. So the one experiment that I'm going to leave you with, aside from your own taste testing, um, create your own experiment compare what it looks like, what different chocolates look like, taste like, feel like, where they melt, what kind of temperature they melt at. The final challenge I will give you is this. Can you melt 
a Cadbury's flake. If you can, I will send you one of these t-shirts. If you can't, but you can send me a really good explanation as to why you can't, I'll send you one as well. Um, so hopefully you're going to have a bit of fun doing your own chocolate experiments tomorrow. Um, enjoy it. And I appreciate all the science that's gone into it, from the engineering, the chemistry, the psychology, people responding to this science, even the packing and the logistics that got that chocolate to your home via the Easter Bunny tomorrow. And enjoy. Thank you, Susie. Very and we, I'm sure we all need more experiments to ex uh, more excuses to experiment with chocolate because it's very serious science. Uh, and I can see you've got some more experimenting still to do. <laughs> we need to make a robust experiment. So, you know, three, three lots at least. <laughs> Fabulous. All right. Well, thank you very much, Suze. Um, now, we are almost at the end of our show here. We have one final thing, uh, which is a song from our favourite physics teacher with a guitar, Johnny Berliner. Uh, but just before that, there's a couple more things to say. Please don't forget the tip jar. If you're the um, adult in the family, then we are... Um, asking people that if, if you're able, only if you're able, if you chuck in a quid or two for the performers and art venues who are not getting work, any work during this period, we'd, we'd appreciate that and so would they. Um, tomorrow we have our weekly Science Shambles Q&A uh, and tomorrow it will be, as well as Robin Ince, it will be me, Chris Lintott and Sarah Parkak and she, so Chris Lintott obviously does lots of things with um, astronomy and galaxies and uh, Galaxy Zoo and all that kind of thing. Sarah is a, an expert on satellites and archaeology so both of them together <laughs> remote sensing of archaeology so if you've got any questions about that please do send them along you can find the email address to send them on the cosmic shambles website or on the uh show notes on the pay on, on the show notes for this um we will also have tomorrow afternoon a special premiere of a new music video for the 50th anniversary of apollo 13 which is coming up very very soon so uh we are very nearly done. The song that Johnny is going to sing is all about radioactive decay, a small departure from Easter eggs. Um, and that song is part of SciTunes, which is his project with music videos and worksheets for homeschooling uh, about on physics and all sorts of things. Loads of interesting stuff, combination of music and physics. And so we will finish now with Johnny and we'll have another show next Saturday with a whole load of different guests. Uh, so I'll see you then and off you go, John. In the middle of every atom you'll find a nucleus which will be made Of protons and neutrons that strongly bind And most nuclei never will change But large nuclei that are bigger than lead Can't hold all their protons in place And some rare isotopes have too many neutrons Are not enough for them to be stable They may decay and radiate particles or high energy EM waves As their nucleus changes, they change their name As their atomic number does not stay the same Unstable nuclei randomly decays that out an alpha or beta Then emit a gamma ray, they may be dangerous Watch out. But we use them every day, yeah Radioactive, radioactive Alpha's a helium nucleus with a charge of plus two and it's slow It won't penetrate paper or skin But that makes emitters more dangerous if they are swallowed Beaters are just fast electrons emitted when neutrons decay So beware, they can get through your skin, ionize you within But aluminium can shield you if you're prepared Gamma rays may not be so ionizing, but they go through most things in their way. You'll need about one inch of lead to protect all your cells from the rays that may go astray. Unstable nuclei randomly decay, spit out an alpha or a beta, then emit a gamma ray. They may be dangerous, but we use them every day, yeah. Radioactive, radioactive. Or 
stop killing yourselves Alpha emitters are in smoke detectors And saving lives all of the time Beta emitters will measure the thickness of paper Or file in a factory line Doctors inject you with gamma emitters To track stuff that's flowing inside If you have a tumor they may kill it with gamma rays So that they don't have to cut you with knives Unstable nuclei Randomly decased it out an alpha or a beta Then emit a gamma ray they may be dangerous But we use them every day, yeah Radioactive, radioactive Every day, yeah. Radioactive, radioactive.